This is Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. Part 2, Chapter 17. The missionaries spent their first four or five nights in the marketplace and went into the village in the morning to preach the gospel. They asked who the king of the village was, but the villagers told them that there was no king. We have men of high title and the chief priests and the elders, they said. It was not very easy getting the men of high title and the elders together after the excitement of the first day, but the missionaries persevered, and in the end, they were received by the rulers of Mbatna. They asked for the plot, a pot, plot of land to build their church. Every clan in the village had its evil forest, and in, in it were all buried all those who died of really evil diseases, like leprosy and smallpox. It was also the dumping ground for all the broughten, or the, for the potent fe fetishes of the great medicine man when they died. And evil force was, therefore, alive with sinister forces and powers of darkness. It was such a force that the rulers of Mbatna gave to the missionaries. They did not really want them in their clan. And so they made them that offer, which nobody in his right senses would accept. They want a piece of land to build their shrine, said Uchiendu to his peers when they consulted among themselves. We shall give them a piece of land. He paused, and there was a murmur of surprise and disagreement. Let us give them a portion of the evil forest. They boast about victory over death. Let us give them a real battlefield in which to show their victory. They laughed and agreed and sent to the, for the missionaries, whom they had asked to leave them for a while so that they might whisper together. They offered them as much of the evil force as they cared to take. In their greatest amazement, the missionaries thanked them and burst into song. They do not understand, said some of the elders, but they will understand when they go to their plot of land tomorrow morning, and they dispersed. The next morning, the crazy man actually began to clear a part of the forest and to build their house. The inhabitants of Mbatna expected them all to be dead within four days. The first day passed, and the second, and the third, and the fourth, and none of them died. Everyone was puzzled, and then it became known that the white man's fetish had unbelievable power. It, had se it was said that he wore glasses on his eyes so that he could talk see and talk to evil spirits. Not long after, he won his first three converts. Although Anoye had been attracted to the new faith, from the very first day, he kept it a secret. He dared not go tell them not to go, not go to the near missionaries for fear of his father. But whenever they came to preach in the open marketplace or the village playground, Anoye was there. And there was already beginning to know some of the simple stories they told. We have now built a church, said Mr. Kaiga, the, inter the interpreter who was now in charge of the infant congregation. The white man had gone back to Amofia, where he built his headquarters, and from where he paid regular visits to Mr. Kaig's congregation at Mbatna. We have now built a church, said Mr. Kaiga, and we want you all to come in every seventh day to worship the true God. On the following Sunday, Anoye passed and repassed the, the little red earth thatch building without summoning enough courage to enter. He entered... He heard the voice of singing, and although it came from a handful of men, it was loud and confident. Their church stood on a circular clearing that looked like the open mouth of an evil forest. Was it waiting to snap its teeth together? After passing and repassing by the church, Anoye returned home. It was well known among the people of Mbatna that their gods and ancestors were sometimes long-suffering and would deliberately allow a man to go on to find them. But even in such cases, they set their limit at seven market weeks, or 28 days. But beyond that limit, no man was suffered to go. And so excitement mounted in their village as the seventh week approached since the impudent missionaries built their church in the evil forest. The villagers were so certain about the doom that awaited these men that one or two converts thought it wise to suspend their allegiance to the new faith. At last the day came by which all missionaries should have died, but they were still alive, building a new red earth and thatch house for their teacher, Mr. Kaiga. That week they won a handful of more converts, and for the first time they had a woman. Her name was Inika. 
the wife of Amandi, who was a prosperous farmer. She was very heavy with child. And Nike had four previous pregnancies and childbirths, but each time she had borne twins, and they had been immediately thrown away. Her husband and his family were already becoming highly critical of such a woman and were not unduly per perturbed when they found she had fled to join the Christians. It was a good riddance. One morning, a Conquo's cousin, Amikuo, was passing by the church on his way to the neighboring village when he saw Anoye among the Christians. He was greatly surprised, and when he got home, he went straight to a Conquo's hut and told him what he had seen. The woman began to talk excitedly, but the Conquo sat unmoved. It was late afternoon before Anoye returned. He went into the obi and saluted his father, but he did not answer. Anoye turned around to walk into the inner compound when his father, suddenly overcome with fury, sprang to his feet and grabbed him by the neck. Where have you been? he stammered. Anoye struggled to free himself from the choking grip. Answer me, roared a Congo, before I kill you. He seized a heavy stick that lay on the dwarf wall and hit him two or three savage blows. Answer me, he roared again. Anoye stood looking at him and did not say a word. The woman, the women were screaming outside, afraid to go in. Leave that boy at once, said a voice in the outer compound. It was Akonkwo's uncle, Uchiendu. Are you mad? Akonkwo did not answer, but he left hold of Anoye, who walked, who walked away and never returned. He went back to the church and told Mr. Kaega that he had decided to go to Amofia, where the white missionary had set up a school to teach young Christians to read and write. Mr. Kaega's joy was very great. Blessed he is who forsakes his father and his mother for my sake, he intoned. Those that hear my words are my father and my mother. Anoye did not fully understand, but he was happy to leave his father. He would return later to his mother and his brother and sisters and convert them to the new faith. As Okonkwo sat in his hut that night, gazing into a log fire, he thought over the matter. A sudden fury rose within him and felt a strong desire to take up his machete, to go to the church and wipe out the entire vile and miscreant gang. But on further thought, he told himself that Anoye was not worth fighting for. Why, he cried in his heart, should he, a Conquo, of all people, be cursed with such a son? He saw clearly in it that the finger of his personal god or chi. For how else could he explain his great misfortune in exile, now his despicable son's behavior. Now that he had enough time to think of it, the son's crime stood out in its shark enormity. To abandon the gods of one's father and to go about with a lot of effeminate men clucking, clucking like old hens was the very depth of abomination. Suppose when he died, all his male children decided to follow Anoye's steps and abandon their ancestors. Akonko felt the cold shudder run through him at the terrible prospect, like the prospect of annihilation. He saw himself and his fathers crowding round their ancestral shrine, waiting in vain for worship and sacrifice and finding nothing but ashes of bygone days. And his children, while praying to the white man's god, if such a thing were to happen, he, Akonkwo, would wipe them off the face of the earth. Akonkwo was popular. Akonkwo was popularly called the Roaring Flame. As he looked into the log fire, he recalled the name. He was a flaming fire. How then could he have, be have begotten son like Nyoye, de degenerate and effeminate? Perhaps he was not. It was, he was not his son. No, he could not be. His wife had played him false. He would teach her, but Anoye reassembled his grandfather, Anoka, who was Okonkwo's father. He pushed the thought out of his mind. Oka he, Okonkwo, was, a calling, was called a flaming fire. How could he have begotten a woman for a son? At, no at Noye's age, Okonkwo had already become famous throughout Amofia for his wrestling and his fearlessness. He hot he s he sighed heavily, as if in symphony, the smoldering log also sighed. And immediately Akonko's eyes were opened as he saw the whole matter clearly. Living fire begets cold, impotent ash. He sighed again deeply.